Good afternoon, Mr. Block. Thank you for oh, letting us come into yes, your well, welcome to my office. Help us understand, what is the role of a cartoonist? Well, uh, the free press was established to serve as a check on the government, to be its best critic. And cartooning is often the razor's edge of that criticism. Razor's edge of criticism? Yeah, yes, of course. Uh, the political cartoon is not a news story, but a, a way to express uh, an editorial opinion. My opinion. Essentially a means of poking fun, you know, for puncturing pomposity and, and getting at an underlying truth. In opposing corruption, the political cartoon has always served as a, uh, as a special prod, a reminder to public servants that they are, after all, <laughs> public servants. Herbert, it's time for dinner. Herbert Block. Son, he's standing right here. There, now it's right, Pa. See? The German Kaiser? Impressive. But why? Why here? Because I want people to walk on him. More than any cartoonist I can ever remember, people would say, hey, did you see her block today? I can't underestimate how influential they were. They, they set the stage somehow in the city. If you hadn't seen her block on a particular Tuesday, you were really out of the loop. There are many breakfasts that were spoiled every morning in Washington, D.C. because of Herb Block.
Sometimes I would see what his pen produced and go, wow. You would not have wanted to be Herb Block's enemy because he was going to nail your hide to the wall. Sometimes you'd open up the Washington Post and be like a punch in the face. One of the drivers of his work was to expose hypocrisy and lying. The influence of money and special interests and just kind of bigotry and demagoguery. Everybody in Washington was afraid of being drawn by her block. Everybody. You didn't want that to happen to you. If someone had said, all right, what do you think that guy does for a living? Uh, you know, I might have said Vermont pharmacist, but I certainly wouldn't have said the most feared editorial cartoonist in the country. Herb Luck was a, a rebirth of the editorial cartoon as a tool of power and, it, a, a, and as an outspoken instrument. Herb Luck is, is one of the touchstones, he's one of the, the, the tent poles of, you know, 20th century satire. The crazy thing is to look at his work from the Depression and his work in the 90s and just see the consistency of his eye, to see his ability to knock down powerful forces and try and bring up those that needed it. This is just somebody who charted his own course and was not afraid. He wasn't afraid of uh, the owners of the Post. He wasn't afraid of the White House. He wasn't afraid of the uh, witch hunting committees in Congress. He believed that an informed citizenry was as necessary for democracy as, as the right to vote. This was a guy who was a prodigy, and he drew all the time, and he developed an ease. His line, his actual line, I don't mean the, the verbal line, I mean the graphic line was saying, this is somebody who knows what he's doing, and, and he did. You know, when you come from the Midwest, there's a certain unabashed, unashamed patriotism, love of country, that you find in Washington in this day and age is very unhip. And he had it unselfconsciously and in a way that he wasn't the least bit embarrassed about. We lived only a few blocks from Cubs Park, and we kids often watched the progress of the games via a scoreboard you could see from the street. My father was a chemist and inventor and good at writing and drawing, as well as mathematics. He taught me to draw and encouraged me when I was young. When I was 11, he entered me in Saturday afternoon classes at the Art Institute of Chicago, and pretty soon, <laughs> I was winning some prizes. Papa loved to take us all over Chicago. We went to the movies, vaudeville shows, the Ziegfeld Follies, and to the outdoor opera at Ravinia. There was always a good deal of laughter in our family. There's a deep uh, patriotic strain that runs through his work. Um, the best kind of patriotism, uh, the patriot who understands that how unusual we are, how much we have to guard and protect our uniqueness, uh, our freedoms, our ability to attract other people, um, and not let it be corrupted by, by politics, by money, by media, um, uh, and by fanaticism. My father had once been a part-time reporter at the Chicago Record and asked about politics and world events at the dinner table. He suggested I sign my drawings by combining my first and last names. My brother Bill was a top reporter for the Chicago Tribune. Chicago politics and newspapering were a colorful business in those days of the front page, Al Capone, and newspaper wars, when trucks and newsstands were part of physical battles. When I graduated from high school, Bill got me a job with a citywide wire service as a police reporter. A couple of weeks later, I received my last paycheck with no explanation for the termination. I was crushed, a failure at 16. <laughs> he believed in the American dream. He believed in, in fairness. He believed that you had an opportunity to go up, to come out of nowhere. At Lake Forest College, I began drawing cartoons, which I then took to the Chicago Daily News in the hope of getting a summer job in 1929. 
A few days later, they phoned. Could you start on Monday? He first appears as a 20-year-old in Chicago. Uh, and really, as a young 20-year-old, he's already talking about fascism in Europe. In the mid-1930s, he was drawing cartoons about Hitler and the threat that he posed to the world before he even became chancellor. America at that time was trying to pretend like the war wouldn't happen. Herb could see it coming. He caught on very quickly to the threat posed by fascism and was quite aggressive in the way he didn't think you could negotiate with Hitler. You think of Herb Locke's reputation, and you think of him as a, as a New Deal Democrat, and you think of him always as a liberal, but he wasn't. He was actually a middle-of-the-road Republican under Hoover. I was never out of work during the Depression, but a lot of people were. And FDR was doing something about it. I see one third of a nation ill-housed, ill-planned, nourished but it is not in despair that I paint that picture for you I paint it for you in hope because the nation seeing and understanding the injustice of it proposes to paint it out the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much it is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. Franklin Roosevelt changed him like he did a lot of people of, of that generation. Herb had a soft spot for Roosevelt's efforts to try to help the little guy and gal. Herb Locke in the 1930s felt that moguls and rich people in Wall Street did not need people to take care of them. It was the unemployed, it was the underprivileged, the people who were suffering. That just went straight to his heart. to have watched as people went through that sort of despair could only make you more outraged at big people taking advantage of little people and at little people being forgotten. And what a formative experience that must have been, what a traumatic experience that must have been, and it has to have informed the rest of his life. As the New Deal took shape, I became, for want of a better term, more liberal. <laughs> And I was moving in the opposite direction of my employer. Uh, they were a conservative syndicate out of New York, the Newspaper Enterprise Association. They were very nervous about Herb, obviously. And that boss made a decision. Herb was too controversial. They wanted to maybe get rid of him, fire him. So when I arrived at Fred Ferguson's NEA office, it seemed there was less of a glad to see you and chit chat than on previous visits. Suddenly, I, I saw the possibility of a useful career that had been getting up a pretty good head of steam coming to an end. And it was happened fortuitously, act of God, whatever you want to say. That was exactly when that boss learned that Herbert won the Pulitzer Prize. The expression, mixed feelings, never showed so clearly on a man's face. <laughs> had an advantage that nobody any longer has, and that is his drawings were seen by everybody. He was very widely syndicated in a time when there were three or four newspapers in every town competing for Herb Locke's drawings. You didn't have all the visual media that you have now. You didn't have cable TV. You didn't have these images coming at you 24-7. You had the newspaper and the most striking direct bolt of lightning out of the newspaper every day was the editorial cartoon. From the 1930s, he was on to the incredible tax breaks and incentives that the oil lobby had gained in Washington and then the impact that that was having over our political life in this country. Long before the energy crisis became a cliché for American politicians, Herb Bloch saw the dangers to American foreign policy of relying so heavily 
on Arab governments that had a monopoly on low-cost oil exports. You think of that cartoon of his of America with its head in the sand and its butt up in the air and a footprint on its butt. He wasn't afraid of anybody. And I think that, again, was part of his, uh, uh, of his great uh, success. He'd take all of them on. And I mean, it didn't make any difference who they were. One of the things that stands out to me was the sense that he wasn't working for anyone but himself. And therefore, he was working for me as the audience. He was approaching each cartoon, each issue he wrote about, with his unique take that was not dictated to him by anything other than his own conscience. We're still funding both sides in the war on terrorism. We fund the US Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps with our tax dollars. And we fund um, Al Qaeda, Islamic Jihad, and the Taliban indirectly with our energy purchases. And as Herb Locke would say, how stupid is that? Having spent practically all of my life being the youngest on the job, it came as something of a surprise to find that during basic training that at 33, I was regarded by the other trainees as the old guy in the room. I was eventually sent to New York where I wrote articles and drew cartoons for Army publications that went all over the world. The New York assignment required occasional trips to the Pentagon where a friend asked what I was going to do when I got out of the service. He said there was, um, there was someone that I needed to meet. Eugene Meyer was Catherine Graham's father. He had worked on Wall Street for the top people there. He becomes the first chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. He was a conservative Republican banker. And when he buys the post at public auction, it's hard to believe, he bought it for $800,000. When he meets Herb, he said, I don't want to hire anybody and tell them what to do. I believe in giving you a complete free hand. And that was the deal. The one story Herb used to tell about that meeting was that Mr. Meyer said, well, the, the, uh, the paper comes out seven days a week, and that would be an appropriate schedule for the cartoonist. So I uh, meet with Mr. Meyer and his lawyer, and he, he had a contract ready for me to sign. I'm sure an agent could have done much better for me, but I, I liked the paper, had always liked Washington, and soon joined up. It was an exciting place for a young cartoonist to be. My work was going to be seen every day by the people I was drawing. The paper was the third newspaper in town, and it had a reputation among some of us childhood liberals as a really great paper. But the great people were, were, was one. It was her block, and they were losing money. And they were committed to producing a newspaper that the world could be proud of. But they had a way to go. After 1954, when we bought the Times Herald, the paper started to get momentum. And Philip Graham was one year on the cover of Time magazine, which was an enormously big deal for the paper. And that cover image is a photograph of my dad against a backdrop of her block cartoons. Phil Graham was feeling his oats. The Post was doing very well as a daily paper. And Phil Graham said, I don't like the cartoons that you're running against Eisenhower for Adlai Stevenson in this campaign, and I'm going to pull them. So Herb said, well, OK, I'm upset, but what can I do? You're the publisher. But I do have to let you know, Phil, that they're being run in syndication. And then there were people in Washington who noticed, well, all of a sudden, where's Herb Locke? Why, why isn't he in the paper? The Washington Daily News sends this editorial up uh, denouncing the move, and all the Washington Post readers want to know, where's her block? Where's my her block? There was such a strong reaction against that that Herb was put back into the paper. And I think it told you a lot about uh, the Phil Graham, number one, but also Herb. I am sure he would have walked out of that door if they had said, from now on, I'm going to censor you. That wasn't the deal. That's not who Herb was. Phil Graham can't say another word, to the point where Herb had total independence for more than 50 years. Well, they never censored a cartoon that I know, but I bet you they said, holy moly, a couple of times. How many people made their living as great editorial cartoonists in America? A dozen? 
to tell a story and to uh, capture political complexity in a couple of line drawings is amazingly difficult. It's really something that happens with the way this kind of arbitrage in your head where you connect dots in ways that other people don't see them. Then you project it into a cartoon in a simplified way that also puts a smile on your face and grabs you, either in the gut or intellectually. I mean, that's just chemistry. That's not academic. To be able to present something complicated in a simple way um, so that you understand and see it and it has an emotional impact, that's artistry. Her block uh, comes out of the tradition of the scabrous cartoonist, the acerbic cartoonist, uh, the cartoonist that you know, sees folly and, and tries to expose it, even tries to write it at times. The strongest political cartoonists, like Daumier or Thomas Nast, had real opinions. Nast helped bring down a corrupt New York politician, Boss Tweed. There's a famous line that Tweed is credited with, I don't care what they say about me, people can't read, but damn those pictures. One of the things editorial cartoons do is very, very simple. They make the powerful look foolish even before we know what the line is. That's important actually on any side of the issue because the powerful, and this is the powerful whether they're Richard Nixon <laughs> or Ronald Reagan or Barack Obama, have the pomp and ceremony, hail to the chief. Humor and ridicule is important here because it levels the playing field. One of the reasons that people are so upset by cartoons and caricatures that are about them or people they identify with is there's no way to answer it. They get to the soul of the matter in a way that is embarrassing to the person they're revealing and or disturbingly enlightening about something that you never want to admit about yourself. They've got me. It lets us at least as people start to question and so, uh, and that's where editorial cartoons are incredibly important and vital. What the editorial cartoon is telling you is it smells funny. Politicians in general are a fearful lot, not just from satirists, from lobbyists, from anybody with an ist. The politician is uh, a salesperson whose trade is to get reelected, you know, so anything that threatens their control or their dominion I imagine they'll be fearful of. Those of us who criticize public officials do not expect them to like our comments as much as those put out by, say, <laughs> well, their press secretaries. A and we're not surprised when some politicians take pot shots at us. When things begin to get rough is when it's suggested that there's something wrong or unpatriotic about criticism of officials and policies and that the press should mind its own business. Are you now, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? One of the reasons that so many of us don't criticize people in power is that we tend to be blinded by the brilliance of their stature. I think the natural reaction is to assume that they, they got there for good reason. And if I don't immediately understand their brilliance, it's because I'm stupid, not because they are. Herb was unencumbered by that self-doubt. The raw, harsh, unpleasant fact is that communism is an issue and will be an issue in 1954. Joe McCarthy was the great arch angle of American life. He was the greatest demagogue in American history, and I say great in the, in the sense that it was the, mo the most significant. He did the most damage. The thing that the American people can do is to be vigilant day and night to make sure they don't have communists teaching the sons and daughters of America. McCarthy brought the nation to its feet on the question of communists in government. And on its feet, the nation did not respond very well. They went along without any kind of evidence. Much of the country believed that, that our government was infiltrated with spies from the Politburo, that they were in the highest positions in the State Department, as McCarthy charged. He created a wave of fear and suspicion, guilt by association, 
He was a bully. He attacked people. He slandered them. He made false claims. He ruined people's reputations. It was a vicious period. I can't talk in the office about how I feel about my politics because I could get in trouble. I could get fired. People did get fired. They were loyal to yours and loyal to yours supported by liberal Democrats. The word peace itself was a no-no. You couldn't say that word peace without being suspected. What you got was to be a liberal was to be a communist, was to be a spy. In recognizing a communist, physical appearance counts for nothing. If he openly declares himself to be a communist, we take his word for it. But there are other communists who don't show their real faces, who work more silently. The purpose was not only to defeat, but to destroy. And many reputable people in and out of government were questioned. Being anti-Joe McCarthy in the early 50s was not without risk. There weren't a lot of people around in those days who were willing to go public and who were willing to stick to their guns. In some respects, an editorial cartoonist occupies the same role that a court jester might occupy. He gets away with stuff that others cannot say. But even court jesters got executed every once in a while. Here is Herb Locke, you know, who's not a, not a journalist. He's not going to the hearings. He's saying, I'm looking at this guy, and this is what I think. Herb had absolutely no compunction about being the first to stand up picture McCarthy as he was and as her block correctly perceived him. What was going on was a kind of unorganized, un-American revolution in which the smear bucket brigade was trying to sack our institutions. Dwight David Eisenhower is paralyzed, paralyzed to even criticize the man when he attacks George Marshall, who had been Eisenhower's closest military confidant and friend. There is McCarthy standing smiling with an ax in his hand and the President of the United States pulling out a feather. Very few cartoonists had the courage, very few editorialists had the courage, and no networks had the courage to attack Joe McCarthy. He got the moral and constitutional imperatives right immediately. McCarthyism becomes a noun in the dictionary from a cartoon of Herb's just a couple of days after McCarthy gives a speech. You know, that famous cartoon, you have this tower of tar buckets and tar brushes. It's a smear campaign, and the elephant of the Republican Party is being pushed toward it reluctantly. And then at the very top, one word, McCarthyism. And keep in mind, a, a cartoon does not tell everything about a subject. It's not supposed to. The test is whether it gets an essential truth. Here is one of the immortal Joe McCarthy cartoons. And it's McCarthy at Herb Block's best. He's dirty looking, he's bearded, he's sweating. He's sweating, he's dark, he's got the five o'clock shadow, uh, and there's a uh, Beelzebub-like quality. Even if he was in the light, he was in shadow, and he was always very liquid. There was always something coming off him whether it was like oil or sweat or whatever it was. And he says, I have here in my hand. Uh, now, all of us who lived in that time know that phrase. I have here in my hand. You see McCarthy's bulk. You see his heaviness. You see his alcoholism. And you can smell his sweat. You can't look at McCarthy the same way after this face has been drilled into you in the morning paper day after day after day. That shapes how you see the guy. Herbach was committing a daily act of courage. And the Washington Post in those days didn't have the power or the stature or the prestige that it gained in the Watergate years. By now, it's a famous story how reluctant, how scared CBS was to let Ed Murrow do his McCarthy show. But they were way behind Herb. No one familiar with the history of his country can deny that congressional committees are useful it is necessary to investigate before legislating. But the line between investigating and persecuting is a very fine one, and the junior senator from Wisconsin has stepped over it repeatedly. His primary achievement has been in confusing the public mind as between the internal and the external threats of communism. We must not confuse dissent with disloyalty. 
And remember that we are not descended from fearful men, not from men who feared to write, to speak, to associate, and to defend causes that were for the moment unpopular. Look at this cartoon. We're talking 1950 now. What do you think this would cost? A chair, a senator's chair. How do we buy a senator? And you think about the biggest problem in my judgment in Washington today is there's so much money going into the hands of these guys. They need so much that a lot of them are for sale. He's not saying he doesn't believe in big money. He's not saying he doesn't believe in people making money. He's just saying he doesn't believe in the effect that it had on the process. Talk about someone who was prescient. I don't think very many people were talking about or writing about or drawing about money and politics in 1950. He just took on those special interests week in and week out. He didn't give a damn about uh, having breakfast with the president as the Allsops cared about or Scotty Reston cared about. Herb was a cartoonist. Cartoonists don't give a damn about connections. There are a lot of people who make accommodations because they want to get social acceptance or they want to be part of some group or they want to get some award or whatever it is. Herb just cared about what he thought was the truth. He never saw himself as someone representing the governors. He saw himself uh, representing the governed. He was mild-mannered. He was Clark Kent. It's when he sat down at his drawing table that he became super cartoonist. was always extraordinarily reserved. But we knew that there was this fire that was never banked, that burned within him about the moral outrage of the man, which was so directed and perceptive. He would be horrified by the word, but he was an intellectual. He thought about these issues. He didn't simply take stuff out of the headlines, as many cartoonists did. And he didn't do gags. He was funny, but he wasn't thinking of how to make the reader laugh. He wanted to make the reader think. He was an unvarnished liberal. There was a time when being a liberal in this country was actually a, a badge of honor. I think Herb was a classic liberal, uh, which was replaced by pussy liberals. Well, if you're going to classify people that way, okay. I, I suppose I'm liberal. Uh, but I, I, I've been called by many people a conservative because I really adhered to just plain old-fashioned ideas about how the country should be run. You know, the, the founders you know, were pretty practical people. They didn't think every newspaper man would have the wisdom of Benjamin Franklin, but they did think that in a system of checks and balances, the free press would serve as an outside check on government, which I consider a cautious, practical, <laughs> conservative <laughs> point of view. Herb Black was a master of the single panel cartoon that made a simple, bold statement that you got and you understood in two or three seconds. By using Mr. Adam, he got people to think about the unthinkable. You know, you could draw the Goya type picture. And when you draw the Goya type picture, everyone says, yeah, you know what? Let me go watch a baseball game. When you made Mr. Adam into a cartoon, you sort of forced this dual vision. We're looking at the dark side, and it's fun, so we can look at it, and then it starts to sink in. And it wasn't enough for him to do the image of the bomb. He created its own thuggish persona. Uh, it's a guy out of uh, Al Capone, Chicago, uh, and he looks like Al Capone. I just think this is so perfectly funny. You got the atom bomb, you know, measuring the earth to blow it up and, uh, and basically saying, ignore me. I mean, it's just five pages of funny in a moment. You know, it makes, 
His succinctness makes what we do on The Daily Show look kind of silly. But you got to remember, too, there's 40 people working on that show. That's just one guy, you know, in a room by himself. You know, with 40 people in his head. <laughs> the bomb was sly. The bomb had gesture, always kind of hunched over. It was quite a specter. And the bomb is not there as a protector, but as an aggressor. And I think that's really important. He did one with the shadow of the atom bomb on the United Nations building, which will never go away because it <laughs> said everything in a way that you can't deal with the problems of the world without being in the shadow of the bomb. These cartoons scared the hell out of me. They just throbbed with the uh, imminence of nuclear war. We were brought up to believe that Khrushchev was evil. Khrushchev was the big hand. And to see Khrushchev and Kennedy on a par, both trying to keep the lid on nuclear war, is really uh, an interesting and enlightened way of looking at foreign policy in the United States. You get someone with that kind of vision within each kind of a discipline, you know, that's a, a, a once-in-a-lifetime deal. Herb had a special status at the Post. Uh, the rule was there's a Chinese wall between the news side, which I worked on, and the editorial side, which he worked on, and they really aren't supposed to cross-pollinate. And uh, he leapt over that Chinese wall every day. He would shuffle out of his office mid-afternoon. Walking very slowly across the newsroom in shirt sleeves with, uh, you know, four or five pieces of paper in his hand. And head for the reporter who was covering the story that he was putting in his cartoon that day. It was a little bit like if Jesus himself were walking around the newsroom. Oh my God, it's him. He'd show them to a, a selected few, and one of the great moments in the life of a Washington Post employee was when he showed it to you. I'd look up in my doorway, and there would be this reluctant, kind of almost diffident guy leaning back, and he'd say, Got a mo? Do you have a moment? And he'd always say, yeah, I got a mo. And he'd come in, and this was a great flattering thing. He parceled out these drawings, five different ones, every day, like cards. And he would show them to you and then say, you know, what do you think of this one? What do you think of that one? Would you look at this one? Would you look at this one? What do you think? What do you think? Which one do you like? Yes, no, this, yes, no. He would start to fact check himself. Is this fair? Is this right? Is this premature? He was searching for reactions, comments, and he only did it if he trusted you and he knew you were going to be candid with him. You're looking at him in awe, and he wanders over and says, you cover City Hall. What's going on there? I couldn't get over the fact that this guy was asking me what I thought, you know, after I had grown up worshiping him. Here is one of the most important journalists of our era asking me my opinion. I've been here maybe a month. He always wanted to check that what he was doing was absolutely correct. And of course, the Herblock cartoon was so incisive and got so directly to the point that it often was premature, but that's only because he could see the future in a way that nobody else could. He was not only trying to find the right cartoon, he was trying to tune into the moment in history. By the time he came to you, he was pretty much on the line that he was going to take, but he wanted to hear it again. He wanted to test it again. In that sense, Herb Block was not only the great cartoonist that he was. He was a great reporter. One of the things that makes a great journalist, and I don't think there's any difference with a great cartoonist, is humility. And because, because if you're humble, you're, you have the ability to ask questions, which is what a journalist has to do. He had to understand what the counter argument was. He didn't have to embrace it. He didn't have to accept it, but he had to understand it, if only because he had to defend his work and defend his point of view. The one who is too far ahead will leave us in the dust. The one who obviously is not ahead at all won't be interesting. But he was just a little ahead of us so that we could catch up and be grateful for the instruction. And yet Herb would never have thought of himself as didactic. It was just he was instructive by nature.
we could sit here and list the things that Herb Block believed in. He was against injustice and unfairness. He identified with the dispossessed, the poor, and folks who are not given an equal chance. He had a set of values, but he wasn't Dr. Nair. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill. He believed in integration. From every mountainside. He believed in civil liberties. He was not a pacifist, but he preferred non-military solutions to military solutions. He put an indelible stamp on how to think about threats to our democracy. And he did it with his art and his wit and his precision. If you look at the issues that defined the Washington Post as a liberal newspaper in the 1960s, there were really a few core issues, and Herb Block helped define them. The Post and I, well, I, I remember during the Vietnam War that we had some disagreements. You'd have Herb Block criticizing the war over here, and then right next to him, where was an editorial voicing support for President Johnson. Herb Block was skeptical of our propping up a dictatorship in South Vietnam long before that was a popular view. He made his own analysis. He was not afraid to break with uh, the conventional wisdom in Washington or at his own newspaper. This is truth. This is just plain truth. And here he was saying Lyndon Johnson was being seduced by this cheap triumph. <laughs> But see, here's the thing. Here, here's what you do with Johnson. So if you surround him with something burlesque, it suddenly transforms what was your traditional caricature into something different. You almost don't even know what to say. It's Vietnam, the war, which was a profound part of my life, is, is the hooker. And then he's, uh, that's our boy Lyndon Johnson, who he also nails his face perfectly. And then you've got you know, his great society. It was a snapshot every day of what the, wor what the world was like. All he did really, was, I, I think, was apply the rules of, the, of, of what human beings should expect from their leadership. It was in a time when one needed strong opinions because the prevailing atmosphere, the political atmosphere, was in another direction. I mean, this was a country who, until we were losing the war in Vietnam, was for the war in Vietnam. The reason we turned against it was because we weren't winning it. That's why we turned against all our wars. It's not for a moral reason. We, we, we find a moral reason when we start to discover that we're not going to win this sucker. Here's Johnson and Ho Chi Minh, prisoners of war. Now, think about this. Herblock didn't have the Johnson tapes. He didn't know what Johnson was saying to Russell about how I'm locked into this thing, I don't see how I can get out of it. Without access to any of that, captured it perfectly. I've got a little old sergeant over at works for me over at the house, and he's got six children. And I just think about sending that father in there, and what the hell are we gonna get out of his doing it? And it, it just uh, makes the chills run up my it back. It does me. I just, I just can't haven't, see it. I haven't got nerve to do it, and uh, other, I don't see any other way out of it. We know now from the tapes that Johnson knew that the Vietnam War was a doomed enterprise, that he would lose politically in the next election if he did not pursue this. Of course, the irony is that he then had to resign because he did pursue this. You could say, wow, Herblock must have heard those tapes. I didn't, but he knew. He had that instinct for the jugular and for the gut. There is almost no question that Lyndon Johnson was furious at the way that he was portrayed by her block. Not only the opposition to the war, 
but particularly Lyndon Johnson was a very vain man. So for Johnson to be depicted as this lout, big stomach, sort of black eyes, big ears, it was exactly what Johnson did not want to be seen as. How could you get back at her? <laughs> there was his view, and if it was a negative view, I mean, you can't buy up all the copies of the Post and destroy him. Our highest officials had deceived the people about the prospects for victory. And all the deceptions had to be supported by more deceptions, by more attacks on critics. Of course, we all knew that politicians didn't always tell it straight, but in a foreign struggle particularly, we wanted to believe that our government was at least on the side of right and honesty. In an almost literal sense, Vietnam marked the end of innocence. I see no diminution in his passion for civil rights than compared to, say, his passion against McCarthy. What bothered Herb a lot was segregation and the federal government's uh, inability, unwillingness, resistance to changing. He believed that that was one of the great injustices of the country. In fact, he felt that it was one of the great weaknesses of the country. It was not just a social problem. It was a, it was a government problem. Herb Locke was really one of the very first in the white mainstream press to address civil rights. Beginning in the late 40s and early 50s, you see a campaign uh, uh, on behalf of civil rights. There's an incredibly powerful drawing called Poplarville, Mississippi, after a, a terrible lynching. But there's nothing funny about the scene. There's nothing funny about the drawing. He was talking about our intolerance and our inability to see each other and to live together. And he saw that separate and apart from what the government's responsibility was. He didn't attack just Southern racism. He attacked Northern racism. He saw it as a scar in general. It was a courageous period for some in the press. It proved that the press can be a great force for good when it engages in great causes. I covered a lot of this stuff. I saw people clubbed to death and marching to try to register and so forth. The caricatures that you see here capture exactly what, what the problem was. You had these bully guys, chains, clubs, that maybe Ku Klux Klan, hoods and so forth. And it wasn't all the South, not everybody was that way, but there was enough of the ignorant haters and beaters and segregationists, and this captured it for me. The feeling that his cartoons gave was, this is the right way to be. I am taking on this enemy or that enemy. This is the right way to be. His basic nobility was that there is a way to behave and a way not to behave a way to treat people and a way not to treat people. He was awfully critical of Eisenhower at a time when he was considered to be a national hero. Eisenhower was a beloved figure, the hero of World War II, won two landslide victories as president. Most people admired him very much. Herblock didn't disagree with that, but one thing he said was very important has been borne out by many historians, and that is, if Ike had used the presidency to begin to make reforms that would give people civil rights, you might not have had the violent revolutions of the 1960s. What's interesting about this cartoon to me is that, and this was true in a lot of Herb's cartoons which used African-American characters, they're very upright. He's making it clear that these were respectable human beings and the only difference was the color of their skin. And he was making an uneven playing field on purpose drawing the most extreme picture of the bad guys and the most upright picture of the good guys. You would go through the paper and look in that upper right-hand corner of the editorial page, 
and say, this is the anchor of the page. This is the anchor of moral thought. This is the anchor of the way we should behave. It was about pictures with meaning, not about pictures to titillate, not about pictures to try and be a carnival barker. And yet journalists today, you know, chase after those stories like ambulances after victims or fire trucks after a fire. And, and there's something crazy about that. And, and you say, well, if you're really interested in, in the public service and being a check, as Herblock said, why are you doing that? Um, and they're doing it because they're in a business that's trying to make money or trying to be, have bragging rights for being first. And I don't think that's very noble. Her block was noble. He had an office that was totally chaotic. If you've ever read the description of Merlin's rooms in The Sword and the Stone, it's exactly that. It was the messiest office I've ever seen in my life. F.A.O. Schwartz would love the place. He had uh, wind-up toys. He had little stuffed animals. All artists are childish. I think it's partly because we are basically immature, partly because only as children can we retain the kind of optimism that produces art. He would watch two cartoon shows, uh, one at 5 and one at 5.30, and the first one was Yogi Bear and the second one was Bullwinkle. Like what? Like what? Well, you ought to know, Bullwinkle. You're in some of them. Well, Part of his magic was his mentality to look at things the way children do. The child will look at somebody and say, he's mean. You don't know why, but they tend to be right. They were pictures of threatening characters and of heroic characters, and it had that quality of a fairy tale, but about something that was real. Being in the next office was like being next to the Marx Brothers and two or three other brothers, and maybe the Ritz Brothers, too. It could be wildly funny. In the middle of a day in which we were all rushing to get the so-called wisdom of the day out by 5 o'clock, we'd be roaring in his office. Herb brought the funny voice or the funny line, the funny face, the funny figure to democracy because he understood that if the democracy didn't laugh at itself, it would crumble from rigidity. The decisions about the world were easy. The ones about his own life were impossible. Herb was a very canny man. He surrounded himself not only with smart people in the newsroom, but caring and very passionate people in his office, people like Gene Rickard and the Blockettes. The Black Cats was an affectionate nickname for the great team of ladies who worked over the years in his office. He would sit there till the wee hours at his desk all by himself, but then he would sleep late in the mornings, and he would come in about noon, getting out of a taxi, because he never drove, and his first query was, what was on the menu at the snack bar? His favorite was tarragon chicken. I, I can reveal that secret now. He lived the Washington Post, and in fact, he gave his home address in the Washington Post directory as the Washington Post. His kids, his children, really were his drawings, and his family really was his office life and his colleagues, and his work was his passion. We all among ourselves would think, what happens when Herb goes home? Because we just saw him all the time in the newsroom. He was a man who was about the work and about the ideas, and the rest was a little bit of a mystery. When Nixon was elected, there's that incredible cartoon of the striped barber's pole, and the caption was, one free shave. What Herb was saying was, I know your prejudices, and I know you probably think that Nixon will violate the office. But for the moment of the election, for the moment of the presidency, we must rise above that suspicion. We have to look at the presidency and not the president. So Nixon was depicted clean shaven, no five o'clock shadow, fresh start, and that didn't last. The honeymoon, well, let's say uh, grace period, did not make it to Christmas. Before 1969 was out, Vice President Spiro Agnew serving as Nixon's Nixon, had been sent around the country to attack the press and to intimidate broadcasters 
pointedly reminding the latter that their stations were under government license. He spoke of an unchecked media elected by no one wielding vast power. His audiences were not likely to shout back that Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and a few other fellows had elected to have a free press separate from government to keep an eye on elected officials. Remember, Nixon was an early target of her block, going back to Nixon's campaign for the Congress against Helen Gahagan Douglas, uh, whom he called the Pink Lady. Nobody knew Nixon's past better than her block did. He understood Nixon was about mud, smearing, and hate. Let me tell you this, Herb Locke took me on 23 years ago in the Hiss case, and he's been against me ever since. Nixon understood that Herb Locke's cartoons were damaging to him. They were shameful. They embarrassed him. They made fun of him. He could read, you know, James Reston or some columnist uh, who might disagree with him, and he could dismiss them easily. It's much harder to dismiss a vivid image and a short caption. Herb, obviously, was Richard Nixon's nemesis. He caught on to him early, and he never wavered in his characterization of him. And what was always striking to me is that, in the end, it paid off. The illegal bugging, apparently, was one of aim of a team which broke into the Democratic National Headquarters in Washington during the weekend, and the political backgrounds of the men charged in the case have kicked up a storm. Bob and myself were disbelieving at first that the President of the United States, Richard Nixon or anybody else, would have done what Nixon did here in Watergate. But Herb had an understanding before the facts of where this was going to go. He got not just Nixon, but the tentacles of Watergate. It wasn't just breaking into the Democratic headquarters. Watergate was about vast constitutional crime on a scale that we have never seen in this country. It was an assault on democracy. What Nixon was doing was paying and hiring people to decide who the Democratic nominee in 1972 would be. It looked like it was going to be Senator Muskie. Vietnam was a big issue. Muskie had the credentials and the solid citizen reputation. Nixon and his people thought Muskie might beat Nixon. So they went about to sabotage his campaign, and they got their candidate. I mean, think about it for a moment. The idea that one political party is going to conduct a well-funded, secret spying and sabotage campaign to decide who they're going to run against. Uh, in a sense, Nixon tampered with everyone's vote. Three days after Watergate, he had a cartoon showing the police ejecting James McCord, who was the lead burglar and the security chief for the Nixon campaign. And outside the Democratic National Headquarters at the Watergate, is Nixon, Kleindienst, and Mitchell. And Nixon is saying, imagine who would have done that. So what Herb had done before the evidence was really in, he said, this is a Nixon trick. This is the Nixon I know. And there's going to be a denial, this kind of innocence, which, uh, of, of course, is the way Nixon played it. I had no prior knowledge of the Watergate break-in. I neither took part in nor knew about any of the subsequent cover-up activities. I neither authorized nor encouraged subordinates to engage in illegal or improper campaign tactics. That was, and that is, the simple truth. Most Americans accepted Nixon's argument that this was a third-rate burglary that had nothing to do with the administration. However, her block with his wonderful antenna said, this reminds me of something. It reminds me of the way that Nixon behaved in California, just what I used to draw cartoons about in the early 1950s. I, I can't recall 
any other administration which had so many scandals and where there was so much that the newspapers needed to do in exposing them. June 23rd, 1972, that's six days after Watergate. He has a drawing of a detective looking down and you see all these footprints leading to the White House. In this cartoon, her block pretty much sums up what Watergate was all about. Most people weren't even taking it seriously, myself uh, included. Uh, I couldn't figure out why anyone would break in to a campaign headquarters. There are no secrets in campaign headquarters. That's where they keep the yard signs. This wasn't on the front page of the New York Times in 1972. It was barely registering even in the, in the, in the Washington Post. We were nowhere near that at that point. I thought it was probably a CIA operation. Uh, in the first few days, I did not think it was going to go to the White House. From the time when the break-in occurred, I pressed repeatedly to know the facts, and particularly whether there was any involvement of anyone in the White House. I considered two things essential. First, that the investigation should be thorough and above board. And second, that if there were any higher involvement, we should get the facts out first. Most of our colleagues at the Post didn't believe it. Herb believed it. I would even say it was more than a belief. He knew. The Nixon people were very good at getting everybody to suspend logical belief, uh, to say, no, we didn't have anything to do with this. Well, logic would tell you all the facts were adding up to that they did have something to do with it. But in all of my years of public life, I have never profited, never profited from public service. I've earned every cent. The pressure on the Washington Post was enormous. When Nixon and his people attacked us, they made our conduct the issue in Watergate rather than the conduct of the president and his men. I have never heard or seen such outrageous, vicious, distorted reporting in 27 years of public life. The leader of the free world and his spokesman were getting up every day and saying we were to Antichrist. It later became very clear uh, that they were out to take away the TV licenses of the Washington Post and rob the Post of its basic source of income. I did not believe the newspaper accounts that suggested the cover-up. I was convinced there was no cover-up because I was convinced that no one had anything to cover up. Tricky Dick was Tricky Dick, and his character was his destiny, and Herb Locke conveyed that. Good morning. At this hour, a select committee of the United States Senate is about to begin public hearings. The word crisis is perhaps too mild to apply to Watergate. The questions that have been raised in the wake of the June 17 break-in strike at the very undergirding of democracy. One of the strongest cartoons and one of the gutsiest was Nixon, this haunted man behind the American flag. So you just see Nixon peering over and around him, money from Mexico, sabotage, forged cables, safes of money, and the caption was national security blanket. And that's exactly what happened. They trotted out national security arguments. Oh, we shouldn't do this. You're going to get into secret CIA covert operations if you pursue this investigation. It probably was one of the more despicable parts of the cover-up to say, oh, don't go here because you will endanger our national security. And Herb nailed it. I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I've earned everything I've got. So what does Herb do with this? He takes the tapes and has Nixon hanging between the two splices, and it has I am a crook with the knot in Nixon's mouth as he's hanging. That's as close to the line as you can get because the knot's there, but it's been spliced out. And so Nixon is saying, I am a crook. The Nixon Herblock showed us was the Nixon that was revealed when we heard the tapes. The nasty comments, the vicious comments, the anti-Semitism, all of that, Herb knew without having to hear any tapes. He understood that in a way that 
virtually no one writing about Nixon or no one else drawing about Nixon got close to. Since Monday, when President Nixon released the new tape, the smoking pistol of the Watergate evidence have tied it directly to him. Events have been rushing toward one seemingly inevitable conclusion, removal from office. I literally remember sitting with a cup of coffee in the morning and looking at the Washington Post in 1973 and this tsunami of scandal enveloping him and Nixon desperately trying to cling on. Holding on for day of life for this desk and water is coming in everywhere. He's being engulfed in a flood. He's not going to, <laughs> he's not gonna leave. You could write uh, an 800 word just vintage, great Meg Greenfield editorial. And I don't think you could quite capture what Herb captures in that one cartoon. This is three weeks before Nixon resigns. Nixon's at this uh, table, and it has all these empty chairs, Agnew guilty, Kleindienst guilty, Kalmbach, who is Nixon's personal lawyer, guilty, Ehrlichman guilty, Colson guilty, and then it says unindicted co-conspirator. This, again, is the theme of Nixon is the haunted man. Nixon was the most disgraced president in the history of the office. And I know, because I would hear from Republicans, and especially from Nixon admirers and confidants, how outraged they were by Herb's treatment of their man. When it came time for Nixon to resign and he didn't want to resign, the Republican elders went down to the White House, not the Democrats and said, Mr. Nixon, you've got to go or we're going to convict you in the Senate. And he left. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Vice President Ford will be sworn in as president at that hour in this office. This is resignation day. Again, it's perfect pitch, symbolically showing that the U.S. Constitution, the system, the Supreme Court, the Justice Department, finally under the special prosecutor, and the Congress all functioned properly. In the end, you always have to uh, say, did you understand your subject? And Herb Luck did. It's interesting now, looking back, I, there's a popular notion that since Watergate, the standards of government morality have become terribly strict. Actually, I believe Watergate succeeded in numbing public views of morality to, to a point where anything less than the expected impeachment of a president failed to arouse outrage. The worst form of corruption is acceptance of corruption doesn't need to be a Watergate. Dishonesty is dishonesty. Scandals are scandals. Corruption is corruption. The fact that public officials can simply stay out of jail does not justify keeping them in public office. As I was preparing for this speech, I, I thought a lot about Herb Locke's philosophy on life that he would mention from time to time. As a cartoonist, Herb was always able to illustrate deeply held convictions about complicated political issues with a few brief strokes. And so it's not surprising then that uh, this simple, graceful, yet profoundly challenging philosophy that expressed itself through the pen uh, was passed down to him uh, from his parents. And he described it as, uh, as the following, be a good citizen and think about the other guy. Throughout Herb's work, it's just a guy who wanted to give a voice to the voiceless, and that transcends the decades. I think if you don't champion the little guy, uh, who is gonna champion? The little guy doesn't tend to have a lot of lobbyists in this town. He understood his role was to speak truth to power on behalf of the country and its values, but also on behalf of all the people who didn't have the voice, the ability, the resources to speak truth to power. An inner city neighborhood with one bright light in the window, and it says inner city public school. But high up on the hill, drawn in nice bright lines, it's a suburban heights public school. And he was drawing the connection 
between what we did for the least among us and what we did for those who could afford to pay it for themselves. There's getting to be a lot of dangerous talk about the public interest. Clearly, these guys don't like the public interest, have no personal interest themselves in serving the public interest. And just think how long it was before we got any kind of really tough legislation passed against the, the tobacco industry, for example. In 1978, when I announced the anti-smoking campaign and really went after the tobacco companies, it was an extraordinarily controversial thing. The Southern congressmen were calling for impeachment and all kinds of things. The next morning, Herblock had a cartoon. What's the issue? Money. They were making so much money selling cigarettes, they didn't care about people dying. When Herblock did it, other cartoonists saw it, and they started doing it. And they were invaluable in terms of getting that campaign off the ground because there was so much opposition from the tobacco companies, so much political opposition from both parties because there was so much tobacco money in politics. When people with large financial interests are helped by government to the tune of vast sums, that is not considered help, aid, or welfare. It's considered part of our economic system. I, I agree that our welfare system should be reformed and, and we can start by recognizing that corporation executives and other representatives of special interests who receive government handouts and special tax benefits are welfare recipients. One of the things that's interesting about Herb Block is he would pick on causes. And that's actually quite important for all journalists to do, to pick on a cause and hit it and hit it and hit it. anybody ever drew as many cartoons on the need for gun control as Herb Block. He felt very strongly that this too was a weakness in the fabric of the nation. Are the kids going to be safe in school? That was it. Are they going to be safe walking home in the streets? Are they going to be safe in their classrooms? He's not just a cartoonist. He's a commentator. He's an investigative journalist and he speaks to the best uh, motives not only of that uh, industry, journalism, which is beset by troubles now, but of our nation. We may be a capitalist society, that's fine. Everybody should have their opportunity, but there's a level of social responsibility that is just run over by people that care only about making money. Remember what Vince Lombardi said about winning? It's not everything, it's the only thing. And it's getting to be like that with money. It's especially that way among the big shots. You know, they've often talked about how poor people have needed to develop a work ethic. Well, a lot of high rollers have developed what I'd call a greed ethic. The fact that Herb went after Democrats shouldn't surprise anyone. He didn't give anyone a free pass because they belonged to the right political party. He had Jimmy Carter right. The White House used to come and pick up the paper right off the presses, and the president would look at this, and you can imagine what he thought. Herblock and Carter had a lot of the same instincts and a lot of the same uh, values. So when he nailed us, it was usually when we had strayed from those shared values or when we were just plain goofy and incompetent. There's one cartoon that is a masterpiece. It's Bill Clinton on a tightrope. One finger, he's got the budget. The other finger, he's got Monica Lewinsky. And the title is Balance. 
There were lots of crass cartoons at the time, as you can imagine. He didn't do that. He restrained himself because his unhappiness was limited to Clinton's uh, falling short of his ideals. For this guy who could, you know, savage you, that's pretty gentle. And the reason is obvious. He was sympathetic to Carter, sympathetic to Clinton. Rarely did you see her blog, um, uh, you know, critical and harsh way of any Democrat that I can recall. <laughs> Even if that's all he did in the whole year, if this cartoon was all he did while Clinton was in office and people say, well, you know, he really didn't, he wasn't this good. If he did it just one of these a year, he was good. Ronald Reagan was many things, but he was always, no matter what his age, a fantastically good-looking guy. Not in Herb's cartoons. In Herb's cartoons, he had about 19 chins. We were not big fans of Herb Locke because we essentially thought he thought we were troglodytes who didn't care about the poor. The charge he made was a charge that Reagan was an aloof, uh, kind of stupid old guy who didn't care about poor people. He saw Reagan as a guy who had a great ability to smooth the country, to cast a spell. This is like perfect. This is Ronald Reagan pushing up the jumbo image of himself, which is why so many people think that he was a remarkable president. And he was in the sense that he gets to the point where he really is a master of presenting himself as mythic. You know, you don't win 49 states when things are going badly in the country, which Reagan, of course, did in 1984. So this kind of cartoon represented a certain viewpoint, but I didn't think it was particularly uh, effective because I don't think it rang true. I mean, he got it. He played the Gipper. He did all that stuff. And people bought it because image is huge. Herb didn't buy that crap as he saw it uh, of, of good old lovable Ronald Reagan. He saw Ronald Reagan as being just as threatening in his way as he had perceived Richard Nixon to be 20 years earlier. I think that Hurt was driven by his ideals rather than by personalities. He didn't, as far as I know, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think he fell in love with presidents. I think he fell in love with what they could accomplish. And if they fell short of what he wanted them to accomplish, then he was disappointed, not angry. I think that the Ideological and partisan divisions within the country have deepened since the late 80s and 90s. And they were deepened further by the George W. Bush election. And in a sense, the atmosphere has really never recovered. It is more intensely partisan and divided than I've ever seen it, and it's pretty ugly. The polarization of our politics in America uh, comes about in part because we don't have common sources of information and therefore we don't have common sets of facts that we can agree or disagree on. The silos we create for ourselves in our media environment it discourages us from talking. If I had one thing I've learned from the last couple of presidential elections I've covered, it's that people stop listening to one another, and I think that's a real problem. Either you're Excuse doing me. RNC talking Excuse points. Excuse me, I'm I don't have RNC. Do. These are Hannity talking points. Journalism has been, I think, degraded uh, in the last 15 or 20 years. And in order for the major news divisions to hold its position and keep its slice of the pie, it had to sweeten that pie and it had to appeal to the lowest common denominator. Just pick up the papers and pick up, you know, what's in the news. Uh, who cares about Paris Hilton? Lady Gaga. That news cycle thing, and it's not even a news cycle. I wish they'd stop talking. It's information cycles because it's not news. It's whatever you could call it a shit cycle. And it comes on a constant level. It's like raw sewage. There's a premium placed on speed increasingly in newsrooms all over the world, and not just in print newsrooms, but in television and radio newsroom and the blogosphere. People are saying, get it out there. Post it quickly. Be the first to get our story out. Well, being first is not always being best and being most accurate. It was a lot easier for me 20 years ago. What was a fact was a fact. The newspaper wrote something. There were people called 
the, remember this, fact checkers. The consequences of all this is uh, an increasingly ill-informed, uh, disconnected electorate that no longer has access to hard reporting, and it makes the country vulnerable to demagogues, right wing, left wing, anything that attracts attention and makes life simpler becomes much more attractive. It doesn't matter to me, really, if you want to get your information from Fox or MSNBC or C-SPAN or PBS. I just want you to get it from somewhere. I want you to be an informed citizen, but an engaged citizen where you actually can talk to people who may not agree with you. It's hard work to stay informed, but our journalistic uh, community tries to make it easy. The way to defend freedom of the press is to use it. The press often needs to get out in front of the politicians, and its voice should add volume to what the politician hears from the still, small voice of conscience. There's a real danger, I think, in, in, in journalism today, where so many people go from, like, right out of college to pundit, to commentator, and you kind of miss that level of actually working with the material and having to, to cover that day to day, which is an enormous source of insight and wisdom. When you feel you're about to spring what you, Governor Romney, think is the checkmate moment of the debate, <laughs> and your debate opponent says to you, please. You know, in some ways, Stephen Colbert and Jon Stewart are an extension of her block. The insights and the essential truths that those two guys get at when they come on the air, I think is very important to my generation and to a younger generation. It brings them into the arena. It gets them engaged because they're always left at the end of a half an hour with something that is provocative. Let me ask you something that has been driving me insane. When did fact-checking and journalism separate? <laughs> Satire is a luxury. I do think that that is one of the difficulties of, of what we do is it can be cathartic, it can be satisfying, but it can also be feckless. I think it can crystallize things, it can add, uh, it can inform in ways that maybe other things can't, but there ain't nothing like good old-fashioned, 24-7, full-on journalism. One of the great pleasures of the presidency is selecting recipients of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest honor given to civilians by the United States of America. Herbert Block, or Herb Block as we know him, became an editorial cartoonist with the Chicago Daily News in 1929. When he found out about the Presidential Medal of Freedom, he danced around the room and he called us all in. I mean, he was just tickled to death. Usually selecting his targets from among the powerful of Washington, every president since Herbert Hoover has known the sting of Herb Locke's pen. He instills in our nation's leaders a dose of humility, reminding all of us that public service is a privilege. He could scald these presidents. He could take them apart limb by limb, as he did, I think he did, with Bill Clinton. I think his disappointment was pretty palpable. But it was impossible not to see the incredible gift that he gave to America through his work and through his honesty and his clarity. And so watching Bill Clinton hang the ribbon around his neck was a beautiful moment. <laughs> I don't think I ever saw Herb Locke out of the newsroom. Herb Locke was not somebody you saw at a lot of Georgetown parties or kind of power restaurants. No power lunches. The uh, power was in the microwave. He was a very shy person, and that's why I think, in a way, very few people knew that he had a private life. Probably most people didn't know Herb had a girlfriend. Her name was Dory Lavelle, and they were together more than 35 years. His work was his life, and I was the, I guess, the other part of his life. He was my family, and I became his because he only had one brother, and he died while we were together. We would often go to the beach on the weekends. He mainly liked to sit and watch the ocean, have his coffee and his papers, and he loved being near the water. 
And the big thing was his little tricycle. This is Herb on his mobile unit, his three-wheeler. He loved being able to go on his own and drive himself. He never learned to drive. But when he got this, he could take his bike and go out and shop and everything. He wanted to stop at the little family dollar store at any hardware store, not for clothing and stuff, but odds and ends. I saw him every weekend, and we did all the occasions. I was his primary social life, and he mine. I didn't even think the years would go by so fast. For over 30 years, a friend of mine and I did New Year's Eve together. It was a highlight of our life. We would go away for the holidays, but always come back from wherever we were to go to Marion's parties. The last New Year's Eve we had together was the Millennium. It was very, very lovely. We didn't know it was the last, but it was. He worked until he died. Most of the years I knew him five cartoons a week. But during the last year or two, it was down to four. And he hated to drop that one cartoon. It wasn't a work week. It was not five days a week, it was four. He was a kind, sweet, dear person out to right wrongs and do the right thing when it needed to be done. When the man died and there wasn't an empty pew in the National Cathedral, which is our largest church in Washington, you knew just how broad his appeal was and how much, most of all, people respected him. The idea that a cartoonist would be given that kind of funeral, it was like Balzac or something had died. Oh, yeah, huge, huge. I mean, it was a state funeral. And when they carried his ashes down the aisle, I just kept thinking, this is a cartoonist? In Herb's will, he had uh, named about 18 people, including me, uh, to be uh, asked if we would set up a, a foundation board. So we all got together in a, in a room like the characters in Agatha Christie novel, or looking at each other, wondering why Herb picked us. I was called by a lawyer. They said Herb had left a will, and he to, money to set up a foundation. And I said, how much did he leave? And he, I thought he said six million. I said, really? I was surprised he left that much. He said, no, $60 million. What? No. That's a lot of money. Whew. Herb actually had a fortune of $90 million. And he used all that money to create the Herb Block Foundation. The Washington Post, immediately in, after uh, World War II, found themselves in dire economic trouble. And the publisher of the Post asked several members of the Post staff, who were relatively well off, if they would invest in the Post. Phil Graham came to Mr. B several times and asked him if he could buy some stock. And so Mr. B did. But then, before the Post went public, the stock split 60 for one, and it subsequently split two for one twice more. When you see a lot of people get rich suddenly, you think, how does it affect them? You think of Herb sitting there in the cafeteria eating lunch and dinner, and it didn't affect him a whole hell of a lot. The Herb Block Foundation is, is a real reflection of Herb Block himself and what he was interested in and what he would like to have accomplished. To advance um, the cause of editorial cartooning and the issues that he had always uh, so deeply believed in. Education, literacy, uh, freedom of the press issues, very important with him. Civil rights issues, very important with him. He clung to those decent values, decade after decade after decade. Now you could call that naive. I'd call it admirable and consistent. Herb was the conscience of the country. There is no question in my mind that this was so. He loved the country as an amalgam of the best things it could hope for. We have this incredible free society, this incredible free market that brings together people from all over the world. There's nothing else like us out there, and that is a precious thing. I think this is what motivated her. That is a truly precious thing. 
which we have to guard and protect every day. If he were here, he would say there's no contradiction between um, criticizing the government or criticizing our policies and, uh, and loving your country. Just the reverse. This is what you do if you love your country. If we don't have voices like Herblock's voice, we won't survive as a democratic society that's fair, that's just, that takes account of all the needs of its people. Herblock was a great American. He served his country well. Absolutely fascinating. We're so grateful. <laughs> My pleasure. Is your camera still on? Yes, it is. To the future politicians out there, I'd like you to do something about what I said earlier, what I called the greed ethic. Now, I, I know you can't do everything, but you can make a beginning. You can set a tone. Keep in mind Harry Truman's words, the buck stops here. And you can add something else. Anything for a buck stops now.